We want to be near or around a hospital system because we think that will be where the lowest vacancy of healthcare related services will be. And then you typically near a large surgery center, you've got rehabilitation centers and you've got blood work places and you've got ambulatory services or prosthetic services or whatever the case may be. Um, so we want to be near those healthcare centers. But for us in the three to $15 million price range, we're not focused on buying the hospital today. Um, we think there's a lot of competition from REITs in those large, large 50 plus million dollar facilities and less so in this three to $15 million range. Welcome to CREPN Radio for influential commercial real estate professionals who work with investors, buyers, and sellers of commercial real estate coast to coast. Whether you're an investor, broker, lender, property manager, attorney, or accountant, we're here to learn from the experts. Welcome to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREEPN Radio. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jay Darren Gross. This is a podcast focused on commercial real estate investment and risk management strategies. Weekly, we have conversations with commercial real estate investors and professionals who provide their experience and insight to help you grow your real estate portfolio. Today's interview is sponsored by Building Insurance and Risk. When you invest in real estate, it pays to work with a real estate investor protection specialist to protect yourself and your investment from catastrophic loss. The experts at Building Insurance Risk focus on real estate investor protection. They provide you with multiple insurance coverage offers and a side-by-side -side coverage comparison. To learn more, go to buildinginsurancerisk.com. Today, my guest is Joe Coltabiano. Joe is the CEO of Healing Realty Trust, a data-driven self-managed real estate investment company with a portfolio of healthcare-related real estate assets dedicated to serving the mental, behavioral, and physical health sectors. And in just a minute, we're going to speak with Joe Caltabiano about uh, what the opportunities are in um, uh, health uh, commercial real estate. But first, a quick reminder, if you like our show, CREPN Radio, there are a couple of things you can do to help us out. You can like, share, and subscribe. And as always, we encourage you to leave a comment. We love to hear from our listeners. Also, if you want to see how handsome our guests are, be sure to check out our YouTube channel. You can find us on YouTube at Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. And while you're there, please subscribe. With that, I want to welcome my guest, Joe Caltabiano. Welcome to CREPN Radio. Thanks, Darren. Excited to be here. Appreciate you taking the time to have me on and uh, look forward to the conversation. I'm excited to have you as well and looking forward to our conversation. But before we get started, if you could take just a minute and share with the listeners a little bit about your background. Sure. Yeah, my uh, my background started in the mortgage banking space. I was a partner at a company called Guaranteed Rate for many years, um, which is one of the largest uh, residential mortgage lenders in the country. When I started there, um, you know, we were a team of maybe 50 people. When I departed, um, it was in excess of 5,000. We we're uh, the seventh largest lender in the country and uh, navigated that company um, kind of on the origination side, where I was the top loan originator for many years, um, through the credit collapse. So certainly lived through the 07, 08, 09 um, kind of credit crunch. We grew that company exponentially during that time, you know, really through a lot of risk mitigation strategies and, and the opportunity to grow during times when others are either destroyed or running scared um, is a lot of times when you put your foot on the gas. And we were fortunate to kind of navigate through that. Um, on a personal note, I had cancer when I was a kid. Um, I had leukemia when I was seven years old, been very involved in philanthropic cancer activities. And in um, 2013, when Illinois passed the compassionate use of medical cannabis, decided to apply for some licenses in that space and was fortunate enough to win three cultivation licenses uh, in the state of Illinois and launched a company called Cresco Labs. Cresco Labs went on to become one of the five largest cannabis companies in the country and there by default, probably the world, um, grew that company, you know, again, from a single state operator to operating in more than 15 states um, with cultivation, manufacturing, distribution and retail all across the country, build out a large real estate portfolio, which we ended up exiting to a public REIT in the cannabis space, um, took Cresco public in 2018, where I served as president up until my retirement in March of 2020, uh, but um, led all the revenue generating activities, wholesale, retail, brand strategy, ran our uh, construction side, our site selection, 
um, all of those type of things. So, so really touched a lot of different things in a, in a very growing industry. Um, then took some time off, launched a SPAC like a lot of people during that time, raised some capital, um, sitting on Zoom calls during uh, kind of COVID. And, uh, and then, uh, again, went back into retirement and was approached by some good friends, um, Cody Chandra and Dan Carcillo, about the idea of launching a REIT in the healthcare space. So here we are to talk about Healing Realty Trust, or HRT, as we fondly refer to it. Um, and um, yeah, we're uh, we're excited to to kind of dig in and tell you the story of HRT. Well, that's a fascinating uh, uh, resume you have there. Uh, I mean, the the explosive growth on um, two of those, and I'm guessing uh, you're hoping for the same with this, uh, the uh, HRT. Um, so I, I, I'm curious, I, I know of the, uh, the, uh, retail, uh, lender, uh, I know they're out here. I'm in, out in Portland, Oregon, and they're, they're out here, uh, the cannabis space. So that, that one's, uh, that, that's a, a really unique one based on all the state laws and stuff. I'm, I mean, that's really impressive what you were able to accomplish with that. And, uh, yeah, I certainly feel fortunate. You know, there was a lot of similarities, oddly enough, between, the mortgage industry and the cannabis industry, especially pre-credit collapse, they were also very state-driven laws. As much as banking has an umbrella, the mortgage industry was really state by state with a lot of the licensing requirements or lack thereof, a lot of the programs that existed or didn't exist. Um, so it really was a lot like the underdeveloped cannabis company reminded me of the pretty early days. And then that industry went, as you can imagine, in the mortgage space from unregulated to hyper-regulated, right? When you have some major uh, event that ultimately gets blamed for, you know, global credit collapse. Um, you can imagine regulations come flying at you, especially from the federal level, which again is very similar to the cannabis industry. It went from kind of a, a, a unknown illicit activity kind of world to a, a hodgepodge of state requirements that got stricter and stricter. And then you start seeing the federal government start to lean in. And I think, you know, certainly during our time, we'll see some some more heavy federal like regulations come in. And yeah, like you said, I've been fortunate. I was in two explosive growth industries kind of on the leading edge of both of those. And, you know, as we get into develop um, Healing Realty Trust, you know, certainly the, the healthcare related commercial assets um, is not new, but we do have a little bit of a twist that we'll get into that, that I think is on the leading edge of medicine that will help um, kind of create some alpha or upside on our commercial real estate portfolio. Got it. So let's first talk, and just so the audience is aware, uh, can you define how a, a real estate trust? I mean, uh, you know, how it is you guys work. Are you are you going after specific properties, or is it more of a fund uh, with with uh, the ability to invest as you see? Yeah. So it's 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 more on the fund side. While it's not a fund, a read is a very specific. Uh, commercial real estate tool that's designed really to maximize some tax benefits uh, for not only the operating company, but also, also the investors. Um, it's a very transparent vehicle. There's a lot of, of re reporting requirements that exist in REITs. And really what's exciting on the investor side is 90% of the distributable income has to get pushed out to investors. So it lines up a lot more with the investors. Um, a lot of real estate deals typically have what's known as a GPLP structure, where there's kind of a waterfall. And, and sometimes the better the deal is, the more money that the, the developer makes or the uh, kind of the, the GP side and the LP makes less based on greater success. That doesn't exist in, in REITs. It's very transparent. There's no what's known as promote or promote feature. Um, the, the money that the REIT makes kind of sits lockstep with the investors. So for me, I've invested, I've been fortunate. I had a good career and I've invested in a lot of different things. And it was always frustrating to me on a real estate deal that I wasn't totally in line with the people putting the deals together. So this was designed to be a little more transparent, a little bit more free flowing. Um, and it, it is a larger structure. It's designed to grow exponentially um, with either the hopes of, of remaining as a private REIT for an extended period of time. But there's also a pathway to take these vehicles public. A lot of the big REITs sit on the New York Stock Exchange and own, you know, uh, huge chunks of of American real estate. So, you know, we certainly have goals set on growing this exponentially to a, a multi-billion dollar portfolio and um, have had experience in public markets. So certainly that's something that we'll, uh, we'll explore if timing's right and the access to capital is beneficial 
from that standpoint. If you can lower your cost of capital by being a public company, um, certainly that becomes very beneficial in commercial real estate, as you know. So you mentioned uh, private versus a public. Uh, obviously, I know public's on the exchange, but, but on as far as a private REIT, is that more of like a, a closely held uh, group of investors or... So it's a very similar structure. You know, the, the difference between a public REIT and a private REIT is is very little. You still have a lot of the same reporting requirements. You still have, a, a you know, the same distribution requirements. Um, you don't have the public reporting requirements in the same way where you're disclosing uh, information on a quarterly basis. But um, there there is a lot more transparency um, on a REIT than, than a GPLP structure, but also you know, you have a little bit more flexibility as a private REIT. Um, you you still can navigate things a little bit quicker, a little bit more nimble than a, a, any public company. You know, a private company certainly has a little more maneuverability. Um, however, being public typically generates a lower cost of capital. That should be, in my opinion, there's two reasons you become public. That's a lower cost of capital for the company and also to create liquidity for your investors. So, you know, you still have... Um, as a private company, a longer duration typically for ex, uh, exits or, or outflows of cash to to your partners who've invested or your investors. Um, so you also create that liquidity by being a public company as well, where people can come in and out. And But you typically run into access where pension funds invest in public REITs and, and you find lower cost of capitals through insurance companies, et cetera. Got it. So you, you, you kind of touched on it, but just, just to reiterate, like in a, a typical, like a syndication, you're pretty well locked up for the length of the investment. And as you mentioned, it, when you go public, the entry exit is, is much more fluid or uh, an investor is able to get in and out more easily. In the in the private structure, is it more like a syndication as far as the, the lockup of your capital for the duration of the investment? Yeah, it's typically with a fund, you have a set time horizon. So in a, in a REIT, you don't have that same time horizon. Usually a REIT is set up to be a long-term passive income vehicle. Unlike, and, and not that real estate isn't in general, but in a REIT structure, it's not, this isn't a seven-year investment vehicle that has a, a three-year acquisition period, a couple-year hold period, and then a two-year kind of wind-down period. This is designed to be a growing portfolio that kicks off a quarterly dividend as required by the REITs. So it really is designed to be, you know, mailbox money, as you've heard a lot in real estate, and I'm sure other guests have said. Um, it's designed to invest capital, kick off a quarterly dividend that hopefully grows as the real estate grows or as, as the cost of capital lowers. You know, and I think consensus wise, we will probably get into it, but interest rates are probably at, a, at near or the, the high side of a bell curve. So as cost of capital comes down, you would expect cash flow and distributions to increase as you're able to ratchet down your cost of capital. So again, it's a passive income vehicle, more like a bond than a, than a deal side syndicated real estate structure. <clears throat> Got it. So as far as the, the deal structure internally uh, for your REIT, um, when you, you raise capital, you've got basically, like we said, like a fund, uh, are you, is there a, a, a percentage leverage kind of a target leverage or is it more of, uh, you know, can can you describe how how leveraged you get into these these uh, properties that you acquire? Yeah, you know, a that's a function of banking, right? So where mm. where are lenders comfortable is is one of the one of the pieces. When you look at public REITs, most of the comps are in the forty to fifty percent leverage. There's an opportunity to take leverage up to probably seventy five percent, even in this market for a company with a, a you know a, a good operating history and access to capital and um, all of those things we'll target <clears throat> somewhere between 50 to 75 percent leverage um, it will start out as a new company on a deal by deal basis so you'll get leverage at the asset level with a REIT the ultimate goal is to grow to more of a corporate line of credit where it's it's a more of a free flowing um, it sits at the corporate holding level less at the asset level. Um, that you're typically accustomed to on uh, other types of real estate deals. But we'll target somewhere between 50 to 75%. We'll be very cost conscious of 
cost of that capital versus cost of investor capital. Again, on a REIT structure, you're pushing out a lot of the distributable income. So you know you you constantly are weighing your cost of capital as as any CEO. If you're not in lockstep on your cost of capital, you'll run a very short company. Um, so we're we're keenly aware of keeping an eye on cost of capital, but on certain deals, and as we go out and acquire properties, they're usually fully tenanted properties with existing cash flow. So our our focus is three to $15 million properties in the contiguous 48 states that touch healthcare. So think MRI clinics, think endodontists, think orthopedic offices, think any of the services that are in or around healthcare that have not been disintermediated by work from home. Outside of maybe a GP or going to your general practitioner to, you know, you've got a sore throat, maybe you can do a little more telemedicine today for things like that. But if you mess up your shoulder, you're going to an orthopedic. There's not a at home kind of treatment for those type of things. If you need if you need braces, you're going to a dentist still. So unlike a lot of the services that exist in other forms of real estate, medical office and 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 healthcare itself is still a hands-on type of activity. So our belief is that asset class will continue to perform because people need to go to their doctor's offices. We'll focus more on the suburban markets and the tertiary markets and less the downtown office markets for a few reasons. We think that the downtown office markets, A, will have a glut of commercial real estate or re retail real estate that can at any time be converted into medical office. And they're going to lower their prices uh, tremendously to attract new tenants in a vertical market environment. You also, we have a belief that the work from home piece, whether it's good or bad, I'll remain silent on, but it doesn't seem like we're a society that's going to go back to five days in the office, sitting in a downtown urban environment and that truck from home, whether your company's two days, three days, four days, or maybe in some circumstances, five. Um, I spent a long time in Chicago, 20 plus years before moving to South Florida. And I know the downtown office is still operating at like 50% based on train capacity and all of the things that you can kind of public data wise, not to mention the anecdotal side of restaurants still closing because they're not getting enough patrons on the lunch crowd. So we think that more people will get their services done in their home markets, right? Meaning they'll go to their doctors in the suburban corridors uh, more so. So that's really another primary part of our focus is the large MSAs that sit outside of large, you know, top 10 city type environments. Um, so those are some of our, our pieces to the puzzle that we're looking at. And again, in that sub-institutional side of three to $15 million, where we feel there's not as much competition because there's really a limited amount of capital available for those type of investors. And banking has gotten more difficult. So as you mentioned, leverage is probably lower today for a new investor than it was. Personal guarantees and, and different underwriting criteria are certainly more rampant. Um, so again, creating some opportunity for us to get in there and build a portfolio in a short duration. For investors looking to get in, uh, is there a minimum investment or do you have a memorandum <clears throat> that, that you- uh, Yeah. So we have a memorandum. With? Yep. We have a memorandum and uh, you know, obviously qualified investors only. Uh, minimum stated investment is 250000 You can syndicate it and put together LLCs, et cetera, again, as long as that entity is a, a qualified investor. Uh, but minimum investments are 250000 You can visit our website at healingrt.com. Um, there's an investor section on there, or you can email me at joe at healingrt.com to get some info and happy to you know, explain to listeners or whomever um, kind of our investment strategy, uh, where we where we sit today, where we're going tomorrow, and, and how we see the future. Uh, but yeah, 250000 for qualified investors. So you talked a little bit about the markets you guys are investing in suburban. Um, is is the the range of, of facilities wide open A to Z, or or is there are there you mentioned uh, dialysis and and um, uh, you know a couple other types of facilities, but is there a is there a sweet spot type of facility you found that really works? Well, you know, for us again, it's it's services that are really required in person but also focus on insurance reimbursed services. So less plastic surgeon, you know, uh, less cash pay type services. We do think, you know, there's, there's going to continue to be some economic headwinds in this country um, for some time. And 
you know, I think people's disposable income will be approaching lower levels than it has in previous years. And I don't see, you know, again, more kind of government influx of money into all of our pockets. I think, you know, the cost of eggs is still going to remain high and the cost of living is still going to remain high. So people are going to have less cash in their pocket to pay for Botox or elective surgeries. So we do focus on insurance reimbursed services as a primary piece where a practice has 70 plus percent of their income coming through insurance reimbursed services. We also focus on being near or around large healthcare systems, whether it's the VA or, or private hospitals, because we also have this belief that as our society continues to grow, you're not going to the hospital to get well anymore. The hospital is really where it's a it's a critical care service. Whereas, you know, if you're going to your orthopedic or even your general practitioner, they're now no longer located in a hospital. They've been pushed out of the hospital to make space for expanded ER. But with that being said, you're more likely to go to an urgent care nowadays than you are an ER um, for a multitude of reasons, especially being that insurance will still cover those places. Um, so there's there's not a difference in your kind of cash outlay. So as services get pushed out of a hospital, we still believe there will be this medical corridor where it sits near a hospital, maybe in some markets it's within a mile, maybe in some markets it's within five miles. Um, so that can vary based on the MSA. But we want to be near or around a hospital system because we think that will be where the lowest vacancy of healthcare related services will be. And then you typically near a large surgery center, you've got rehabilitation centers and you've got blood work places and you've got ambulatory services or prosthetic services or whatever the case may be. Um, so we want to be near those healthcare centers. But for us in the three to $15 million price range, we're not focused on buying the hospital today. Um, we think there's a lot of competition from REITs in those large, large 50 plus million dollar facilities and less so in this three to $15 million range. You know, we recognize we will be grinding through more deals and looking at more deals and kissing a lot of frogs, unfortunately. Um, but we think that there's a great value in those type of properties um, that will have very low vacancy, very high um, tenant absorption, very stable businesses that have been in business a long time. And we also like the fact that medical practitioners don't typically get up and move. You know, it's not like a tech company that can just take their business elsewhere and still perform the same services because they're talking to people online. You build a base business and a lot of times medical, at least in years past, can be generational where businesses get passed down. Um, now with private equity coming in and consolidating some of that space, maybe less so that, but we do think that they service local communities and become an integral part of communities for an extended period of time. And as you know, in commercial real estate, the value of your property is based on the quality of the tenant. So um, that's that's a big piece we look for national tenants, obviously, the duration of leases and obviously the rent that they pay. So we like the fact that the medical sector typically is a long duration tenant. They don't typically just pick up and move for a different space or certainly they don't move into a different city. Yes, yeah, so let me ask you the the. the um... I mean, you've identified the the wares and the types of properties. I was just sitting there thinking a little bit about, you know, a lot of uh, uh, medical office buildings. They they're typically well kept. I mean, the the uh, capital improvements are are uh, up to snuff. You don't find like an old, outdated medical building. Um, do you find yeah, usually not that, asbestos in there, right? Yeah, there, <laughs> I mean, it, it's the, you know, if there's carpet, it's usually newer. Uh, you know, the, the, there's not like lots of wear and tear that I'm thinking of in, in the medical buildings I've been to. Um, but at the same time, I'm curious, do you find that uh, a lot of the opportunities that uh, you're investing in, are they of newer uh, construction uh, or do you find, or is that even an issue with what you're doing? Yeah, it, it varies. You're right that the upkeep on the buildings, you know, the deals we've, we've purchased and have under contract and negotiating LOI on um, usually are, are very well-kept buildings. There, there's not, um, deferred maintenance that isn't getting completed. You know, we're finding good buildings. When we look at, you know, we're very cap rate focused, right? So we're looking for a nine cap and above on the type of properties we're buying. So, you know, as much as I would love to tell you that exists in South Florida with some new construction building, it doesn't, right? We're, we're looking more in the Rust Belt areas or we're finding things more in the Rust Belt area, the Northeast, the Southwest, um, 
So a little bit older buildings, a lot of times they're aging sellers. You know, they've owned these buildings for 20 plus years. A lot of times they were the developer when they built them. You know, you see a lot of people in commercial real estate who build and hold. It's a, it's a great long-term asset. And they've experienced multiple economic cycles, um, but they've had a really good run since 08, right? They've had a, they've had a great, you know, if you bought buildings in, in 08, et cetera, you, you did very well on, on pretty much any piece of real estate, especially, you know, rent yielding commercial real estate. Um, but now as loans are maturing or loans are coming due, you've got sellers who are 70 plus years old um, and they've gotten their value out of that property. They've seen values come down over the last two, three years, just based on interest rates, right? Commercial real estate, obviously the value a lot of is is on the cost of capital that goes into it. So these may have been seven caps two years ago, and now they're nine caps. Um, so, you know, we're seeing good value where sellers, they don't want to refinance their loan, right? They don't want to put more equity into a deal. They don't want to personally guarantee a loan that they've had for five years, 10 years, and didn't have a personal guarantee, but bank criteria has changed. Banks have sold or collapsed also. So a lot of the, you know, the banks in Columbus, Ohio, or pick some middle America city, there's not as many local banks where you walk in and have known that banker for a long period of time. They now work for Chase or Key Bank or some of the bigger banks. So that's also a turnoff for them to kind of refinance that property and go through that whole process. So we're in a we're in a situation where we're finding great value from an aging seller group, but again, also has tremendous pride of what they own. You've got a lot of local owners. So they know they don't want to be at church and uh, be known as the slumlord who owns that dingy medical property down the street. That's not a good look. And, and your tenants in medical who've been a lot of times in these places for an extended period of time are relationships, you know, more so than your traditional downtown office where you're just a number. Um, these are local owners a lot of times with local tenants who serve the community and sit next to those people in church and the grocery store and, and the country club. So they really have pride in their assets, as you mentioned. And it's, it's something that, that we find, you know, a refreshing from a business standpoint where people actually have pride of what they own, but from a, from a underwriting and a business standpoint, these buildings are in fantastic shape. Let me ask you about the, um, you mentioned about the, the, the length of the ten, tenant uh, stays usually ongoing. Does that in itself provide uh, better terms when dealing with your lenders? Do they look more favorably on, on medical? I've, I've, I've not uh, dealt with medical Medi personally. Sure. So gonna... Medical is a very stable asset class that banks like more than retail you know, certainly, or a restaurant, right? I, I guess restaurant probably sits at the bottom rung of that um, with medical self-storage, you know, kind of sitting at the top rung of that. So yes, they like, they, for all the reasons that I've outlaid, you know, banks from an underwriting standpoint or from a, um, a risk mitigation standpoint, you know, find medical buildings perform at a higher rate. You also typically have lower, um, um, lower default rate on, on insurance reimbursed medical practices. Um, with that said, they still look at the same, you know, they want a longer Walt, you know, it's it's great to know that someone's going to renew a lease, but you'd much rather have a longer lease in place. With us buying properties that have very little deferred maintenance, a lot of times we're also able to go in and talk to the tenants and hear what, you know, they want. And in exchange for maybe some TI dollars, maybe they'll sign a new lease early. So, you know, we're, we're certainly in a, a you know, our value add strategy from the property itself is less about, you know, redoing some major system because again, the deferred maintenance is very low, but maybe coming in and putting some new paint and carpet in an individual unit in exchange for a renewed lease um, is something that we're looking at. We're also finding that a lot of these properties are either self-managed or have local management in place. And a lot of times they haven't maximized rent value. So as rents maybe have gone up in, in the market, there is maybe a little bit too many times they've sat next to that person in church and didn't raise their rents in accordance with CPI or, or whatever traditional measurement you want to look at. So we're also finding that a lot of these leases are undervalued. Um, so, you know, there's some some upside opportunity to standardize the leases and bring them a little more current. 
Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Just the the rent growth potential. Um, does it pretty much follow inflation? Is that kind of the the trend line? Yeah, I mean that's that's again, it's city by city, it's MSA by MSA. But I would say that you know CPI is a is a pretty good thing to to look at, and you know all the services, all costs have gone up, right? And I was I was just having a conversation with a friend who who runs a medical practice, and he's like, we raised our prices three percent this year. And I said, well, what did your staffing costs go up this year? What'd your water bill go up this year? You know, it's way more than 3%. So, you know, there's that balance of um, being a good and nice landlord and also understanding where we were in a hyperinflationary environment. So, you know, if you didn't reflect your cost of operations as leases came up, like shame on you to a certain extent, because the, the power company didn't care what the tenant was paying before it's what's the current cost plus their margin and that's your new your new cost and you know unfortunately rent can be like that too because as you approach you know any type of depression situation or where there's a pullback in costs um people will leave right you have to modify rents down in some instances to re-sign leases too so if you don't take advantage of uh, and maybe not take advantage of, but if you don't pass on the third party costs that are impacting your bottom line and your investor's bottom line, um, it's short-sighted in my side. But if you're an aging seller who's owned a building for a long time and that's been your long tenant and you've got a great relationship and you've owned that property, you know, you you you're generating free cash flow from it. Maybe you're a little more inclined than a new buyer is who's coming in and but recognizing I'm willing to put a few dollars in to get them to to re-sign a new lease. You know, there's there's always a a, there's a good way to be a, a intelligent and thoughtful landlord and still be a good landlord. Yeah. Win-win. Um, let me ask you, where do you find most of your opportunities? You've talked about older sellers, but are you going direct or are you going through uh, a brokers or? Yeah, we use, we use a, a fair amount of brokers. Um, you know, we, we do stuff with CBRE and Cushman and, and JLL and, you know, uh, a company called Blueprint who really lives in the healthcare space. Um, so we, we work with brokers. We're scouring all of the sources ourselves. We've got an internal real estate team. Um, and then, you know, we also have started to build out a, a healthcare network um, where we're in communications with friends who own clinics and different things and businesses. And what we're also finding is a lot of owner operators. You know, there's a fair amount of sale leaseback opportunity here where you've got a operator who has a good business and maybe they've got one or two locations, uh, but they're looking to expand. And as much as we know that real estate money has gotten tighter and more expensive, operating business money has gotten even more expensive, not to mention if you're trying to raise operating capital. So if you're looking to scale up your business and maybe open a second or third or fourth location with you know, potentially the hopes of selling out to private equity or something like that. Um, there's a lot of sellers who the only access to good capital is selling the building, generating, you know, some capital in your pocket from that and going out and buying a second property. Um, and then we're also there, you know, we'd love to have a multi-tenant relationship or, or a tenant with multiple properties um, rather than underwriting, you know, two tenants. If you can underwrite one tenant and multiple properties, it's a much easier thing for our team and I think develops good longstanding relationships. So, you know, that's also something we're looking at is businesses that are doing very well and our team's constantly contacting people who are in the news and seeing, you know, uh, good growth stories coming, um, the ability to expand on that. And then to add kind of our alpha or our upside strategy where we really see some changes coming is in the psychedelic assisted therapies. So what I mean by that on the federally legal side is ketamine today is a, um, a, a dynamic change in mental and behavioral health where you're seeing these types of products utilized much more um, regularly. They're very different than your typical SSID or you know over-the-counter not or prescription generated medicine where you take a pill and you get that pill from Walgreens and then you take it at home. These drugs like ketamine are done in clinic. And what that means is a patient is in their clinic for a much longer period of time. The typical dose for ketamine requires a two hour duration appointment. So now a psychiatrist who maybe had an average time with a patient of 27 or 30 minutes, whatever the national average is, now has those patients in their rooms for two plus year or two plus hours. 
So that changes kind of the flow of an office. So as you can imagine, the infrastructure that's in place is not conducive for multiple patients at the same time. It's kind of changed the business. So as we go out and our primary focus is just buying good commercial real estate, fully tenanted, et cetera, where the, the lion's share of our revenue comes from that, our backfill strategy as tenants either move out or there is vacancy in a building is we're focused on finding these operators who have a goal to scale up uh, maybe a ketamine business today where they they plan on opening 10, 15, 20 clinics. And some of our proprietary data shows us where those services are underutilized in the country. And when I talk about growth, uh, if you flash back two years, there were 27 of these clinics. Today, there's 2,700 of these clinics. So it's an wow. explosive growth category. The downside is... You know, the typical psychiatrist maybe wants 1,500 to 3,000 square feet. Maybe some will have 7,000 square foot clinics. So it's not an anchor tenant, right? You're not bringing in right. a, a large ambulatory service, but it's a f- fantastic backfill type of tenant. And what we've gone out and done is sign national relationships or, or relationships with, with people in regions that want to expand their services across the country or in a respective area. They've got the secret sauce. They understand how they've done this business and they're looking to scale it up to go from seven clinics to 25 clinics, again, with the hopes for them that they get rolled up through private equity or there's some consolidation in that space. That for us is incredibly beneficial because you go from John and Bill Smith being your tenant to XYZ, you know, national company that's that's highly credited. You're you're continuing to improve the value of our real estate. And then as you can find a building, maybe that's 85% occupied going in, knowing that it's a perfect location for these new tenants. Uh, again, you can lease up your building pretty quickly and, and create a value add that way. Have you found any of your sellers uh, reinvest into your, uh, your REIT? Not yet. Uh, good question. We've had some conversations about um, some of that. You know, one of the downsides of setting up a REIT is you really can't use a 1031 structure in the same way that you can in another deal. There's a incredibly complex way to do it. And again, if it was a $50 million deal, you'd probably go through some of the gymnastics, but on a $5 million building, kind of this up REIT wrap around, wham, bam, whatever, you yeah. know, the attorneys get paid half the money. Um, you may not pay the IRS, but you're, you're writing your attorney half that money. Um, right. It, it's not as common. So I would say that's probably one of our, our downsides to the structure is sellers um, do need to get paid. Got it. Now Got they it. can 1031 into other things, but um, for us, we, we can't kind of keep that capital in the ecosystem. Right. No, I was just kind of curious if, if uh, and I, I'm assuming if people have held these buildings for any time at all, um, the, uh, the depreciation recapture and the gain is significant enough that, uh, you know, rather they don't want to pay the tax, probably looking for an exchange. So makes yep. sense. Yeah. And we, we've had sellers ask. Um, it's just not not in our structure. Um, again, probably something, um, you know, I, I would say we missed on that component. But you trade out for, you know, investors who like REITs and typically write larger checks into something that's as transparent as a REIT. Sure. Do you guys do any development or is it strictly acquisition and release? Right. Right now we are risk adverse. So I know that's a, a term you you probably like to use in, in your world, but we're we're pretty risk adverse. We're not looking for entitlement risk. We're not looking for construction risk. Um, we're not uh, you know, outside of a place where we know we've got a tenant who's been looking to take three thousand square feet in that local area. You know, we're really focused on um, buildings that are, you know, have good walts, have good tenants, have have, you know, low deferred maintenance. We're not looking for large CapEx projects because, again, construction costs are high. Um, construction risk is high. Uh, permitting times are high. Like all of the things line up. And I'm sure there's some developers who will do very well during this time because I know most people are pretty risk adverse. And sometimes coming out of the ground when all that's going on is is a great strategy because you don't have that competition um, you know, uh, sitting to the left and right of you when you deliver a project. But no, we're really not focused on much construction stuff or zero right now. We'll buy properties that maybe have an outlaw that that we can, you know, do some value add in the future potentially or carve out and sell off. Um, but we're not looking to to do any major construction projects at this time. Got it. 
Hey, Joe, if we could, I'd like to uh, shift gears here for a second. Uh, by day, I'm an insurance broker, and uh, as such, I work with my clients to assess risk and determine what to do with the risk. And there's uh, three strategies we typically consider. Uh, we first look to see if there's a way we can avoid the risk. When that's not an option, then we look to see if there's a way we can minimize the risk. And if we cannot avoid nor minimize the risk, we look to see if we can transfer the risk. And that's what an insurance policy is. It's a risk transfer vehicle. And uh, as such, I like to ask my guests if they can look at their own situation. Uh, it could be clients, investors, the Fed, uh, the economy, uh, national security, whatever that might be, uh, and identify what you consider to be the biggest risk. And uh, again, for clarification, while I'm an insurance broker, I'm not necessarily looking for an insurance-related answer. And uh, so if you're willing, I'd like to ask you, Joe Caltabiano, what is the biggest risk? So in, in real estate, you know, I think the the number one risk as you're looking to grow a real estate portfolio is access to capital. And that access can come in the form of equity or debt. But, you know, as you have um, tightening of free cash flow for people, maybe their investment dollars are a little smaller. And as we sit as a private REIT, unlike a public company, you know, where you're, you're, you're picking up multi-million dollar checks, you know, our check size, again, the minimum for qualified investors is 250,000. Those are regular people a lot of times. So they are impacted by, you know, what's going on in, in the world. So access to capital, not only on the equity side and, and what's in people's pockets today, but also access to capital through the lending institutions and banks. So kind of blending out, you know, where that, where that risk it is and ultimately what's your cost of capital because if you build a model that anticipates x as a return and you're wildly off because access to capital became lack of access to capital creates a higher cost of capital because as the pools shrink you're paying more to get that money in in either the form of equity or in the form of interest rate so access to capital is by far the driving factor of of kind of number one risk thing for us. So what that means is I talk to more investors than I did in both of my previous industries. You know, my hit rate for success is probably lower than my fragile ego thought it would be when I when I got into this space. Um, but talking to more investors, you know, spreading a, a wider net to talk to more people. And then on the debt side, it's talking to more banks and more lending institutions. Because unfortunately, until you have that fully signed deal with them, things can happen. I've seen banks close. I've been in mid underwriting where the board decides to shut off lending. Um, you know, and that's, again, they do that to protect themselves. It's never anything personal with you because they wouldn't have given you the term sheet. But when a board says we're not lending more money, there's very few things you can say to the loan officer to get them to open up that vault and, and give you capital. So, you know, talk to more investors, talk to more banks, casting a broader net, um, and really just getting out there and playing the hand-to-hand -hand combat game, which which I certainly enjoy. But again, when we launched Healing Realty Trust, uh, you know, a year plus ago, um, I would have thought there was more capital than than maybe I was able to stumble into. Oh. Now, well said. Uh, capital is kind of the mother's milk of real estate. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, easy. It's the juice. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It is. Hey, Joe, where can the listeners go if they'd like to learn more or connect with you? Yeah, so email is is always the best for me directly, and that's joe at healingrt.com. So joe at H-E-A-L-I-N-G-R-T.com or uh, healingrt.com is our website, and there's there's a bunch of click-through options on there to find out more of selling us property. We're certainly an active buyer across the country, um, or if you're interested in investing, you know, we'd love to talk more and, and kind of walk you through our strategy. Got it. Well, Joe Caltabiano, thanks so much for taking the time today. I've uh, enjoyed it, learned a lot, and uh, look forward to doing it again soon. Thanks, Darren. I appreciate you having us and, and really enjoyed speaking with you and, and hope your listeners find this valuable. So talk soon and have a great day. All right. For our listeners, if you like this episode, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Remember, the more you know, the more you grow. That's all we've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio.
You're listening to CREPN Radio for influential commercial real estate professionals. For more information on this or any of our guests, like us on Facebook, CREPN Radio.